Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar focused on flipping the nursing classroom. My name is Jennifer Scherze and I'm a Senior Marketing Manager here at Jones & Bartlett Learning. Before I turn the presentation over, I want to give a very warm welcome and introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Karen Hessler. Dr. Hessler currently teaches as an Associate Professor of Nursing and recently took on the role of Associate Director of Graduate Programs at the University of Northern Colorado School of Nursing. She has been interested in innovative classroom strategies, the use of technology in the classroom and clinical settings, as well as strategies to improve adult learning outcomes. As you can imagine, Dr. Hessler continues to seek new ways to engage her students in the classroom while providing the most current and technologically based educational experiences for nursing students in both the graduate and undergraduate nursing programs. And she's also been asked to speak several times on the flip nursing classroom topic, too. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Karen Hessler. Karen, please go ahead. Thank you, Jennifer, for that nice introduction. Um, I, I just want to thank you all for taking time out of your very busy schedules to just take a moment to think about the flipped classroom and how we might be able to use the flipped classroom in nursing education. And to do that, we probably ought to start with talking about what exactly is the flipped classroom. There is a nice website called the Flipped Learning Network that was developed by the pioneers of flipping, John Bergman and Aaron Sams. And these are two K-12 teachers, high school teachers, who actually began to flip their classrooms um, for not really the, any purpose of making learning better within the classroom, ironically. Um, they wanted to be able to make it easier for students to be absent from their classes. For example, if students had to leave a class early or had to leave on a Friday, for example, to go to a sporting event, then they would simply use the technology that was, was available at the time to record the lecture. But then they started to think about that. How, what, how would our classroom be different if we did that anyways for all the students? And then when they came to class, we would help them engage with the material. So as the schematic shows, on your slide in front of you. The traditional classroom is more about students doing maybe some reading at home or printing out PowerPoint notes for lecture. I know I've had my students do that for years. Um, and myself, as the instructor, would prepare the lecture materials, usually right up to the last minute. Um, the students would listen to me lecture and tell them and try to transfer knowledge to them while they took notes on the lecture. The instructor, or myself, was really the center of the class. And I, the instructor, had control of the class. And actually, I felt very comfortable with that, being a little bit type A. Um, I really liked that environment. However, the flipped classroom looks at learning a little bit differently. So instead of me giving that lecture to the students in the classroom while they're all sitting in their seats, diligently taking notes, I would instead record a shorter lecture with some sort of technology that would help them to review that or listen to it ahead of time. Then when they come to class, um, we focus on student application of what they had learned in their video with many groups, some individual activities. Myself, as the instructor, now I'm able to support the students in their learning, to assess individual learning, and let the students be the center of the class. So I just wanted to read a specific definition from the Flipped Learning Network that has been worked and reworked by several um, flipping experts. And um, I believe John Bergman and Aaron Sams were using, are part of this definition as well. So flipped learning is a pedagogical approach in which direct instruction moves from the group learning space to the individual learning space. The resultant group space is transformed into this dynamic, interactive learning environment where the educator guides the student as they apply concepts and engage creatively in the subject matter. So flipped learning is different than interactive learning, but it's really similar as well. So the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about how those are different, but also similar. When I've talked about the flipped learning um, classroom it, at conferences, I've had a lot of nurse educators that have come up to me and said, well, I've done interactive learning in the classroom for years, so I'm, I've been flipping and doing this for years. But it is a little bit different. So I'm going to share a few things that are on your slide and a few things that are not on your slide. 
Um, when I have used interactive learning in the classroom when the classroom was not necessarily flipped, what I've done is lecture first, and then I have this smaller amount of time for interactive learning strategies to use within the classroom time. But in the flipped classroom, I'm able to take that lecture and put it entirely outside of the classroom as homework that the student will do prior to coming to class. In this way, I use those lower ordered learning objectives in the offload content prior to coming to class. So things start a little bit easier for my student to learn. Things that I think they're going to get, you know, just sitting, sitting there listening to my lecture, I can now have them do prior to coming to class. So with interactive learning, if you still have some of that lecture in your classroom, you're still working on those lower ordered objectives in the classroom space. And you don't have as much time to get to those higher ordered learning objectives. In the flipped classroom, we will have more time for application of content during interactive learning sessions in the classroom. But in interactive learning, again, a little bit less time for that application. And in many cases, I don't know if any of you would be able to relate to this, but many times I would lecture and lecture and lecture and I have so much to say uh, that I never really got to my interactive learning. And we had to do it the next class or we just, it just simply got dropped off of the agenda. Similarly, in the flipped classroom, the students still have lecture. I love this because a lot of uh, nursing faculty will say to me, students need lecture. And I said, oh no, they still have lecture. They just listen to their lecture on their own time. Ooh, one of the greatest things about this is they can pause me when I'm talking. I don't know if any of you have the same sort of comment from your students, but my students always say, Karen, you talk too fast. We can't write that fast. And I always tell them that they just need to speed up their thinking. But that is not student-centered, is it? That is instructor-centered. So I have come to realize that that is not an effective way for them to learn anything. Seriously, writing down notes, trying to keep up with my verbose uh, ability to talk very, very quickly in the classroom. This way, they can pause me. They can rewind me. They can slow down my voice if they want to, or they can speed me up and make me go even faster if they want to. It's a really great learning tool that my students have used over and over and over and have really come to enjoy. So in interactive learning, similarly, students can still have some lecture time, but it does take up class time. They can't pause me. They can't rewind me. If they miss it, they miss it. And many times they're afraid or nervous to stop the whole lecture and try to get understanding for just themselves, one person out of a sea of students in your classroom. So flipping is a little bit different. And there are four pillars of flipped learning that are listed on the Flipped Learning Network that I thought I would just mention real quickly. It goes along with the acronym of FLIP. So the F in the word FLIP stands for flexible environment, where the students are part of choosing when and where they want to learn and the instructors have got to be a little bit more flexible about their expectations of student timelines for learning and the way that they're going to assess learning. The L in the FLIP acronym stands for learning culture. So in the traditional model, the instructor is the primary source of information. But you know what? We live in a different age than when a lot of us were educated as nurses. We have the internet. Readily inform information is readily at our fingertips. Khan Academy videos, YouTube, you name it. There are all sorts of ways that students can be really good consumers of information. Times are changing. So in the flipped model, we deliberately shift that instruction to be more of a student-centered approach. Just use that to our advantage instead of being upset that they wanted Google topics. Use that to our advantage. Students become more actively involved in knowledge construction this way, and they participate and evaluate their own learning in many, many ways. The flipped learning culture also makes learning personally meaningful, which is really important to the digital native student. This is a true definition of student-centered learning, which can be a challenge for folks like me who have been instructor-centered for most of their lives. But if I can do it, you can do it too. The I on flipped uh, acronym is for intentional content. This means that the flip model is focused on helping students in the classroom develop more of a conceptual understanding, application, and a development of procedural fluency. Instructors develop content in a more intentional manner in this way. So we're determined not to tell the students what they need to know, but we provide them with direction for exploration and help them in self-discovery of information. 
we use intentional content to maximize that classroom where time where we have contact with the student. And P in the flipped or sorry in the flip acronym, it stands for professional educators. Professional educators are so important in the flipped model. I know that some of the literature says that nursing faculty are afraid that if we record all of our lectures, then what do they need us for? Oh my goodness, we're the expert. We're the guide on the side. They need us even more in the flipped learning classroom. We are continually observing. We're continually providing feedback that's relevant and in the moment to our students. And we're assessing their work and their understanding in real time, which is very exciting. Professional ed educators also have to use reflective practice. We have to connect with each other and improve our approaches, use some constructive criticism, and be able to tolerate a little bit of controlled chaos in our classroom. So the next slide is going to talk to us a little bit about why I wrote this text. There are many presentations on the method. I went to a lot of these presentations myself um, while I was flipping and found that a lot of the faculty were saying the same things that I was saying. There are a few small sample size studies in the literature and several how-to or basically how-not-to articles for nurse educators out there. But something was missing. Even after I did a four-hour pre-session for nursing faculty at a conference last summer on how to, or I guess it was two summers ago, on how to flip the nursing classroom, the participants still said, we need a book. We need a manual. You should write about that. Hence, the flip learning for nursing classroom book. So what's different about this book? Well, I read Bergman and Sam prior to flipping my classroom. So we'll go to the next slide to say what's different about this book. Um, this book is really specific to nursing education. Even though I had Bergman and Sam's text, I had a lot of websites. I had some of the informational articles that were out there for nurses. I didn't have enough. It just seemed like there, most of the information that was out there was focused on the K-12 classroom. This book is written by a nurse educator for nurse educators, and I think it's fun. It's not so informational that it's boring. I actually had one of the peer reviewers say um, that it was much more conversational and entertaining um, than most of the nursing education texts out there, which I think is a compliment because I don't like to read boring things. Uh, hence, I don't like to write boring things. So this is True Confessions, real stories about my flipping experiences and my experiences about why I decided that I wanted to flip the classroom. It's full of practical applications, and it's all from nursing faculty who are flipping the classroom. This book contains all of the things, all of the advice and direction that I would give to you if you and I were sitting across the table together enjoying a cup of coffee, just talking about nursing education. I'm moving on to about the text, and we're going to talk about the nine chapters that are all focused on different aspects of flipping the classroom, but directly related to nursing education. So if we can go to the next slide about chapter content, I'll start to describe to you a little bit about each one of these chapters. So chapter one is called, Why Flip the Nursing Classroom? So you might have already figured out that this is an argument of why we should consider flipping the nursing classroom. Um, it really is written in light of the current literature, the IOM report. Um, Binner and colleagues test text on educating nurses, a call for radical transformation. What a great, great text that is. Um, about adult learning attention span, about digital native versus digital immigrant, all those sorts of things are in that chapter. Chapter two is evidence-based nursing or nurse pedagogy. Show me the research. Now, most nurse educators at the conferences where I've presented on this topic um, trust me to a certain extent, but they all want to know about the evidence behind why they should flip. As good evidence-based practitioners, they refuse to flip without several random controlled trials on the subject. So what I did was look throughout the literature and at everything that I could find on higher education flipping and primarily mostly what was informational about health, the health sciences. And like a good evidence-based practitioner myself, I did rate that evidence for you in the book. Chapter three is the intentional instruction model. Now, this is a model that my, my friend and colleague, very good friend and colleague, uh, Catherine Johnson, Kat Johnson, we call her, 
and I developed prior to presenting about the topic at conferences. And that model actually morphed into the model that I'll share with you here in a minute today during the webinar. Chapters four and five were uh, very, very intentional on my part because I believe that faculty do not prepare well enough for the flipping classroom. And that's where we end up having most of our trouble. This is my story. This is why, why I wrote that, because I was not prepared. I just jumped off to the deep end and thought, man, this sounds like a great method. And I didn't really do my research or prepare myself well enough. So chapter four really focuses on how you, as a faculty member in nursing, can really prepare well for the flipped classroom. And we all know that with great preparation usually comes a better chance of success. And chapter five, similarly, but different, is preparing your students for the flipped classroom. Boy, I learned very quickly that much of the resistance that I felt from my students when I tried to flip their classroom came from their lack of preparation and understanding, or excuse me, the lack of my preparation in helping them in their understanding of how their day-to-day -day classes and learning would be changing. I just sort of flipped everything on them and then expected them to just give me applause, and that is not what happened at all. So chapter five really talks about how to prepare your students for flipping and give a good argument to them for flipping. Chapter six talks about pieces of the model. One of those pieces is the offload content. This is, what do I want my students to do prior to coming to class? Um, and chapter seven is, similarly, now what? How do you manage your time effectively in the flipped classroom? Nurse educators that have shared with me their nervousness about what to do with their class time now. How are they gonna manage all these hours that they have with the students if they don't do lecture? Don't worry, chapter seven helps you with this. It helps you to really think about how to use your objectives and really make sure that we are doing higher ordered learning with them in the classroom. So in terms of the book, this is really a meat chapter. It's really full of a lot of information. Ooh, no offense to any vegetarians that might be in the audience. And chapter eight is, did it work well? Of course, anytime we have an educational idea when we implement a new procedure, so on and so forth, we must think about evaluation and quality improvement. And chapter eight really helps um, nurse educators think about that during the process. Chapter nine, those flipping nursing instructors. I love this chapter. I found several nurse educators who had been flipping their classrooms and that were willing to be interviewed for the book. I asked them to share their ideas and pick one or two classes that they flipped that were very positive and they felt like really went very well but I also asked them to share their flip tips with the reader. This is probably my favorite chapter in the whole book. It has inspired me to want to do some solid research in this area of how educators can really help each other learn and think about teaching and nursing or teaching nursing in different ways. I learned so much more when I interviewed these people and when I wrote up their exemplars that I went back to that preparation for faculty chapter and I added in a section about getting a group of flipping nursing instructors together on your campus to share ideas. And in fact, in the book, I, I apologize, I didn't really talk about nursing instructors. Of course, we need to talk to each other. But I just talked about flipping instructors, anybody across campus. I know that I have really enjoyed working with some of the pioneers in flipping on our campus who are excellent math professors. And they give me excellent ideas. So the next slide really has a few bullet points about how you might be able to use this text in your own practice. I think a pre-read and using it as a guide prior to flipping the classroom would probably be the best way to use the text. If you've already flipped the classroom and you've not been successful, I am sure this book is going to turn that around for you. Um, and then you could consider using the model in the book to help guide your flipped classroom preparation, implementation, and of course, evaluation. So the next slides will talk a little bit about the Jones and Bartlett learning process of using peer-reviewed um, feedback for all of their products. These are some quotes from the peer reviewers of the book that we were really excited to hear about, such positive feedback. And we wanted to share some of them with you during the webinar. This first one just talks about the book being a great introduction of the topic of flipped learning to nursing educators. Um, it talks about how 
you know, a lot within the first chapter, but all the way through as threads in the book, I tried to make a connection with essential nursing documents and thoughts and critical thinking. And it says also in the, in the quote, the book begins with a thought-provoking discussion as to why one should consider the flipping classroom. And I really believe in that myself. So it was great to get that feedback. The next reviewer that had uh, written a comment is a little bit more lengthy. But really what it's saying is that um, it has a, the book has a strong theoretical foundation, but also has really strong practical application um, for flipped con concepts of to nursing education practice in specifically. Strong arguments are poised to support restructuring of education using current literature themes of cultural competency, adult learning responsibility, and development of clinically competent critical thinking nurses to meet current healthcare practice demands. Last but not least, a practical example of individualized learning at its best. I was so happy to see that quote because really, flipped learning is individualized learning. So let me take just a few minutes to talk to you about the intentional instruction model. Um, as you know, at the top of the model there in the green, you'll see learning objectives. And we all know that all must flow from these learning objectives. But we can use the lower ordered learning objectives to help the student master content that is more lower level um, learning objectives. We can save those higher ordered learning objectives for our class time when we as the instructors are there to help our students through the more difficult higher ordered learning. So lower order, ordered learning objectives per Bloom's taxonomy, just a quick review, I think you all know this, but the lower orders are where we're asking students to maybe name, explain, describe, any time we're asking a student to just remember and try to understand content at a pretty rudimentary level. Whereas the higher order learning objectives are where we're asking a student to examine, illustrate, compare and contrast, justify, prioritize, plan, those sorts of things where we asking, we're asking them to apply, analyze, evaluate, and maybe create new ideas, new knowledge. The next part uh, might be a little surprising to you, but I find that it's extremely important with the flipped classroom in my view. And that is the partnering with the students. So we already have the learning objectives. Students aren't terribly um, good yet, unless they're nursing education students, maybe I should say that, at actually writing the learning objectives. But they can help us from there to decide how they want to apply that content, how they want to learn. After implementing the method and really reviewing and being reflective about how I had originally implemented the flipped classroom, I came to the realization that I was still in my old paradigm. I was still saying, I am knowledge, student, you need to sit down and receive my knowledge model. But then I needed to change that model and became very contemplative on how I could do that with the flipped learning. So I reviewed a lot of books, a lot of articles on um, partnering with students on digital natives versus digital immigrant, and I started to realize how different I was from the audience that I was trying to educate. So if I wanted my students to learn, I realized that I needed to be more flexible and adjust my old school ways of the way that I had been taught in nursing education to match my students' view and world. So instead of making all 76 or 34 or 150 students in my classroom conform to my ideas, I only really had to change one person's viewpoint, and that was my own. And that was sort of a big aha moment for me. I began to understand that if I could conform my ways and my teaching to match their ways of learning and, and necessity of technology and so forth, and that's all in the book, then it really changed my life as an educator. I completely believe in this process, and I write about this pretty extensively in the book. I hope you'll enjoy it if you decide to pick up a copy. The bottom part of the model there is the offload and in-class activities. You'll notice that those aren't separate, but fluid concepts. So the offload is what you will assign the students prior to coming to class. It is not extra work. Please don't give your students extra PowerPoints. You think, oh, I can't really... Um, get to that topic, so I'm going to record a video and put it out for them, and then I'm going to test them on it anyways. That is not the way the flipped classroom is supposed to be designed. Um, the offload is to prepare students with those lower order objectives to engage in higher ordered learning when they're coming to the classroom and have you there to help them with that. 
So the in-class activities, this is where the, we get the great reward as educators. We get to help students learn in their own way, on their own timetable. They are very engaged in learning activities when they are done well and they really match the offload content. We will be able to get them to catch that learning fever. That is just awesome when you see that happen with the students, isn't it? And when they're a part of the knowledge development rather than just sitting in the seat trying to be a receiver of your knowledge as the instructor. I learn student things from my students every day in my flipped classroom, but it doesn't take too much to realize that when I'm lecturing, I don't give them a chance to teach me anything. I don't really give them much of a chance to interact with me much either. So there is that line on the model in between offload and in-class that's dotted because sometimes these will be more on one side than the other or vice versa. Uh, in meaning that we might have more offload and less in class, or we might have a little bit of offload and a lot of in class, but they should all be one fluid set of concepts. Don't separate those. They should all flow from the learning objectives and all be about the same information. As you see, there's a little red arrow there that discusses evaluation. So we can't forget to be that reflective educator, adjust when things don't work well, or maybe adjust even when you think they went well and you have some better ideas. This is all about quality improvement. We do it really well in the hospital setting, and we don't do it as well, in my own humble opinion, as nurse educators. So the chapter on evaluation can help you out with this. You see that it goes across the offload and the in-class activities because some uh, faculty who like to flip the classroom would like to know that students have actually done the offload content and are ready to engage in the class activities. So there are some evaluation ideas to make sure that students are actually doing the offload content um, and being ready to engage in in-class activities. So if you want to know how the flipped classroom went, I have a hint for you. Just ask your students, trust me, they will tell you. So experiences with flipping are the next couple of slides. Um, I think I shared a little bit about this, but my first uh, flipping experiences were not the greatest. I'll be really honest with you. I learned lessons the hard way. My friend Kat and I, I went to a seminar here on a, or a, a faculty development thing on campus and I thought, hey, this is awesome. This is what we need. We flipped the entire class. We did not prepare ourselves well. We did not prepare our students well. And we learned a lot of lessons the hard way. And looking back, we were able to do so much better the next time uh, that we, we attempted the flipped classroom. So my goal is to have other nursing faculty learn from my mistakes. Don't go out and make the same mistakes. You can just read the text, learn from my mistakes, and just go into it with eyes wide open, doing it very successfully. Because the method can be very successful if it is done correctly. So I would also say try to avoid some common challenges that you might have within the flipped classroom. And these are all um, really addressed in the book. To prepare yourself for, for flipping the classroom. Prepare your students well for flipping. Don't just throw it on them like I did and then expect them to be happy. It just is not going to happen. I did not prepare my students well, but I do now and I've got great ideas for you in that chapter. Be ready for some common complaints and small setbacks. But you know what? I tend to experience some common complaints and small setbacks no matter what sort of method I use in the classroom. So this is really not that much of a surprise. And I think flipped learning or the flipped classroom gets a bad name because, oh, students don't like it, or, well, students don't like a lot of the things that I've done in the classroom. But it's usually two out of the 70, for example, that weren't happy with it. Help your students, students learn how to study, and more importantly, help them learn how to learn. I, I'm very surprised sometimes when I'm working with students in the classroom that they don't really know how to study. They don't really know how to think about concepts in a way that will help them when they're actually in the clinical environment or in a testing environment. And then I start to realize, oh my gosh, how many years have I taught with straight lecture and I never knew what I was missing with these students. I wish I could recapture all of those years that I was not flipping to go back in time and flip. Then, of course, evaluate the entire process. Make it better the next time. Don't give up on it. It's really a cool method. You're going to find that your energy for nursing education is just going to explode when you start to use this method. Maybe not the first time, because remember, novice to expert does take some time, as Benner has taught us very well in nursing. 
So to get started flipping your classroom, make sure you use all the available resources that you have. This flipped classroom text is a great start for you, but try to engage with your instructional design team on your campus if you can. Talk to peers who are flipping. Don't have to be from nursing. They can be anywhere. Um, websites and blogs for the flipped classroom are very helpful. And you might want to use tutor tutorials for any of the video capture software um, if you're going to use videos for your offload learning. Um, start slow and then proceed when successful. Don't be silly like me and flip an entire course and then wonder why it didn't go well. Flip one unit, for example, or one class in a course first and see how that went. Start with subjects that you know well because remember, you're the guide on the side. So if I'm the guide on the side, I have got to know the content because I'm going to be answering questions that might not have even been on my learning objectives but are connected to the learning objectives. So things that I might not have gone over in lecture, for example, I will be addressing with the students in the flipped classroom. And in that way, it makes it really exciting learning because I just flip it back on them, flip uh, it back on them and tell them, hey, we're all engaged in a, in a cooperative learning here. So you find out what you can learn about that and then we'll talk about it as a group. Don't be too hard on yourself. This is a process and it takes some time. And if you start slower and you don't succeed, then think about how you can reevaluate and do it better the next time. So the next slide just talks about keep on flipping. Remember that there are lots of things that are different about flipping, not just the way that we're using our classroom time, but the way that we're using our classroom space. So this sort of dawned on me one day, I'm flipping the classroom, but I've got the chairs in the same line as they were before, like we were at some conference where we're all sitting by each other and trying to stay awake. No, no, what I do now is move the table, move the chairs, sometimes move the tables completely out of the way. And the students enjoy sitting on the floor, maybe going out in the hallway. If it's a nice day, sometimes we go outside. Yes, yes, I know this is gonna be a question. Every once in a while, I lose a couple of them, but I get them back, I kind of corral them back in, but it gives them the freedom. And I trust them to get their learning done. And some students get it done a little more quickly, some students take a little bit more time, especially when we're talking about individual but also group work. So I have some great ideas for you in that how to manage class time chapter about how to make that a more fluid process. So evaluate, revise for next flip class. Like I said before, even if things go well, I'm always thinking about how I can do it better the next time. Don't be afraid to be creative. Think of ways to capture each learner's attention. Think about the different learning styles. Be creative about all the different ways. And I think that flip tips and that last chapter, chapter nine, the flipping faculty interviews are gonna give you some great ideas because those faculty are from a variety of different professional viewpoints. For example, psych and um, let me think, I think we have a pediatrics in there and we have a core courses for like theory, that sort of thing. Consider partnering with your students to create that shared learning environment and I think that they will be more engaged with the classroom if they have more ownership within it. And long-term flipping goals. When successful, entire move, or consider moving on and flipping your entire course. You might want to think before you do that about collecting data and disseminating that data. So thinking about an IRB proposal, for example, for some sort of scholarship of teaching and learning article. Because, like I said, um, and you will learn if you pick up a copy of the text in chapter two, there aren't a lot of very good studies that are telling us um, outcomes wise how this is much different. Um, so it would be very helpful to have that information. And I encourage you to do that also within the text. And then keep in mind that flipped learning is all about ways that you can maximize your face-to-face -face time with your students. Thank you so much for your attention and your time. And I think that we have a few minutes now for any questions that can come through the system. Great, thank you, Dr. Hessler. That was a fantastic presentation, very engaging and very informative. And at this point, I want to encourage any of the participants on the line, if you have a question, you can uh, message myself, the host, or Charlotte Sweet, she's listed as one of the panelists. We're happy to take some questions with the remaining time that we have left. And just while we're waiting for some questions to get into the queue, if you want to learn more or if you would like to request a review copy for a course adoption um, and want to consider that to use that when it comes out early next year, you can visit go.jblearning.com backslash 
flip preview, or if you would like to purchase a copy, you can just note the URL, go.jblearning.com slash flip. And you could also share this webinar and um, watch it again in the future. It will be posted within a week to the events page of our community site. And over the next several months, Dr. Hessler will be sharing uh, some tips that she's learned about flipping the classroom and will share some best practices. And we'll do that via our Facebook site. So if you're not already uh, a fan of ours, we do invite you to join that page. It's www.facebook.com slash JBL nursing. At this point, do we have any uh, questions, Elaine, that have come in? One moment. And while Elaine's just working on getting someone into the queue, we do have a question from Lisa. And she asks, Karen, what works best for offloading instructor videos, audio lectures, YouTube videos, guided readings? Can all of these be utilized? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I talk about this a little bit in the offload chapter of the book and give you some ideas. Um, I really thought to myself to begin with, um, I don't have a lot of extra time. You know, I've got small children. I've got a life. I've got other stuff going on. So I'm just going to find some YouTube videos that will really, or some maybe Khan Academy, they're going to address what I need them to, my students to learn for offload. Um, what I found is that I spent an incredible amount of time trying to find a video that actually would say what I wanted to say. What I learned from that is that I might have a video that, you know, that really speaks to maybe one or two learning objectives that I want them to get to offload but not necessarily what I would say to them in the classroom if I was lecturing. So I really just submitted to the fact and the knowledge that I wanted to be the one who was giving them the information. I wanted it to be specific. I wanted it to be what I wanted to tell them as their um, guide on the side and their instructor. And therefore, I just started doing all my own videos. Sometimes what I would do would say, uh, watch this video first on, for example, I'm flipping this week on um, um, menstrual issues in my family nurse practitioner um, diagnosis and management class, and I wanted them to have a nice review of the menstrual cycle. Could not find anything out there. So what I did was have them watch one little video clip on something about ovulation, and very, very short, like two, three minutes, and then I said, watch my video, which really talks about the anterior pituitary axis and so on and so forth all the things that I would have told them if I were lecturing with them um, in front of the classroom. I also try to keep my offload very, very short, so I only do maybe 10, 15-minute videos. Um, my students will tell you every once in a while I get to 20, but I try to make them very engaging and interesting and tell them that this would be a good place to break in the video if you want to watch the rest later, for example. And I don't get into a lot of editing with my videos. I just say I don't get to edit my lectures when I'm talking with them um, in the classroom, so I don't edit a whole lot. I, if I miss a word, then I just sort of uh, make fun of myself and say, well, that's not what I meant to say, and I just keep going. Um, my students have told me that they like to listen to my videos more than if I give them a Khan Academy or something. There's something about the student, and I think there might be a nice research study here, too, Something about the student being able to listen to their own instructor's voice in the offload and then be able to engage that same instructor during the in-class activities. Now, my colleague, um, Jerry Overmeyer, that works over in math, and he is actually a pioneer on the uh, flipped learning on this campus, and that's the um, faculty development I went to before I started flipping was Jerry Overmeyer's, and he has found the same thing with his math students, that, that they really like to listen to his videos and if given the choice of his video or two other videos and they only had time to watch one, students are pretty vocal about, I watch Jerry's video or I watch Karen's video, I don't watch the other one. So it's a kind of a combination of wanting to tell them what I want to tell them about the topic and being more specific about that. And it's also a combination of not being able to find a lot of uh, videos that really speak to what I want to tell them. So I tend to use that. I, I use, sometimes I have them make, for example, a concept map um, ahead of time, and but I always do it sort of within the video. I, I'll be really honest, I use video quite a bit in my flipping, and I find that students really like, I try to always make sure it's an MP4 so that they can download it on any device, and they can watch it on their iPad or iPhone or wh whatever droid, whatever they're using. Um, so uh, that's what I tend to do. There are also some great apps that you can use to record lectures. 
uh, there are great uh, resources out there now for faculty who are more interested in flipping the classroom. It's a great time. You know, Elaine, I see a question down here on the um, prompting by Cynthia Anderson. Do you mind if I go ahead and answer that one? Sure, go ahead. Is that okay? Because this is a very common question that I get from uh, faculty that come to my workshops and seminars. And Cynthia is asking, how do you know your students actually listen to your lecture? This is a very good question. There are some examples in the evaluation chapter about how you can determine that. Um, there, you can do some mini quizzes, uh, which many faculty will use. Uh, many times there are instructions in the video that I give them to bring something to class with them. Not something in like, you know, a bedpan or something, but uh, like some sort of product. For example, if I say, we're going to be talking about this evidence-based literature, you need to go and search the literature and bring an evidence-based article. And that's, that's one way that I know. Um, another way are learning passes or, or a ticket to ride. My colleague Kat uh, Johnson used to use ticket to ride quite a bit. And that would be um, several questions that she would have the students fill out in relation to the lecture. Um, I'll tell you, I think maybe some of those things uh, Kat has done more than I have because she teaches a little bit more in the undergraduate program, and I teach in the graduate program. And really, um, I used to be worried about this, Cynthia, but I am not worried about it anymore. I just am um, thinking that some of the students maybe might even have those lower ordered objectives down already, and they, if they don't watch the video, they can still engage in the classroom. Some of, the, some of the students will actually come up to me and say, you know, Karen, I didn't have time to watch the videos. What should I do? And I give them a choice. I say, well, you can either engage and do the best you can, or you might want to run down to the computer lab or grab your device and run out in the hallway because it's only 10 or 15 minutes, um, and I usually only have one or two. And many times they will try to just fold in, and what ends up happening is a lot of peer instruction. So they do sort of rely on their peers a little bit, which, which can be um, – a little bit burdensome for some of the peers, but what I'm finding, especially when I keep the groups the same all semester, um, they get to a point where, hey, you know, I didn't watch the video last week, and you watched the video this week, and that sort of thing, and they're doing a little bit of peer instruction, too. So um, I don't get so nervous so much anymore about my students um, watching the video, but if you're, if you're worried about that, then there are several ways uh, in the evaluation chapter talking about how you can evaluate whether students have done the offload content. Great. Thanks so much, um, Karen. I think since we're having a little bit of trouble with people getting into the queue, I think we might just stick to some of the questions we have via okay. chat. And I know one of the questions that has come up um, was around how do you measure um, the data and the performance of, you know, a flipped classroom course besides, you know, the feedback that you get from students? What other measurement tools might you have in place? Yeah, that's a really good question. A lot of the literature that I discuss in, in Chapter 2 uh, really addresses that, that most of the folks that have done some scholarship of uh, teaching and learning on this topic have tried to look at grades. Um, but it really comes to, like, apples and oranges a little bit because you're looking at one set of students that had a different um, set of variables, and then you're comparing with another set of students that has another set of variables. So that set of students might have had better or worse grades regardless. Um, we, I'm, I'm going to be doing a study at the end of this semester uh, that's, that's more of a qualitative study looking at um, students who, I, I, I'm team teaching a course, so the first half of the course they had straight lecture with my colleague, and now they're having straight flipping with me. And I want to sit down with those students, and I might have, um, my colleagues sit down with them instead so they don't feel like they have to say that they liked it in front of me, but really talk about which method they felt like they learned more from. Um, I think some of the uh, measurements are difficult with this because we're getting at higher ordered learning, we're getting at maybe more critical thinking, which is always a difficult thing to measure. Um, but I know a lot of the work that's been done so far is looking at test scores, and um, I'd like to see a study on retention of content, too, because um, theoretically, when you think about cognitive load theory, if we teach students in this manner where we engage their brains and help them build schema in a different way, we can increase the knowledge um, gained, not necessarily increase the knowledge, but move it into the long-term 
memory instead of always keeping it in that short-term memory. And then theoretically, if it's in the long-term memory, they'll be able to pull it out at a later date. And that's one of the things that our cognitive load study with the interactive PowerPoint showed us uh, was that retention was much higher in those students. These studies take, you know, a lot of work. They take a lot of time and, and longitudinal type measures. Um, and I think maybe some of those would be extremely helpful. Great. Thanks, Karen. Um, Two-part question here. We have some participants wondering what the best class size is for implementing the flipped classroom. And then how much in-class time do you actually spend with your students? Well, I'll ask, I'll ask the answer the second part first. I spend all the in-class time with my students um, engaged in learning. And the, and the, the chapter on in-class activities really talks about how to manage that. I'll be really honest, I was terrible at managing this when I first started it because I would have this sort of in-class activity that I thought was going to take an hour and it took them 15 minutes. And then I was sitting there going, oh boy, now what do I do? So now I have a plan for that and I have an idea. And then the next time I flip the classroom with that activity, I actually put down it takes 15 to 20 minutes. So part of that is that evaluation um, when you use those things and part of it is planning for things to take too long or not enough time. So I spend, you know, every minute of my class just in engaging with my students, sometimes individually, um, sometimes in groups. Most of the time in groups is what I do. The class size is a little bit um, trickier. I think I have a little bit of an advantage in that most of my master's classes, the sizes are not that large. However, I do know a lot of nursing instructors, and I wish I could remember her name because she was the uh, so energetic about using an entire lecture hall. I think she had um, over 100 students, and she was flipping the classroom with her 100 students. She was doing a quick quiz at the beginning to make sure that they were, they were uh, doing the offload content. She had lots of great um, in-class activities, group activities that they would do pair and share, all sorts of things. So I think that, you know, it'd be nicer to have a smaller class size because then you can get to each student. And I think that's one thing that might be um, significantly different between nursing education in larger classrooms and, for example, K-12 education. The other thing is we don't have our students every day for an entire school year. I mean, you get to know your students when you have them every day for an entire school year. And one of the things, you know, even when I had a class of 76 students in my lecture hall, I always wanted to learn every student's name. I just felt like that was really, really important, and that's a very difficult thing to do when you only have them for 16 weeks in the classroom. So part of that individual learning is more difficult, I think, for nursing instructors to get to. So even if we don't know each one of their names, we can start to get a better understanding of their um, ability and how they learn if we start to engage with them um, with this type of a learning model. So. I don't know a good answer for exact uh, class size, but I will admit I think it's easier for me in a smaller class than when I try to do this uh, with my larger undergraduate classes. Because there's chaos, and then there's chaos. So <laughs> I hope that answers your question. And another question, Karen, we have a few instructors too that uh, are wondering if you have any recommendations for how to create uh, videos and online lectures, as well as how to create and upload uh, podcasts. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, you know, I, what I do with my lectures, and I put this in the book too, is I, I used to think about, okay, what do I want them to know when I start to make a new PowerPoint? And that was taking a lot of my time. And I thought, well, I still want them to have lecture material. I still would tell them about the same things. Um, but I split it up. So if I think that my lecture is going to be longer than 15 minutes on the video, I'll split my PowerPoint into two different, and I use PowerPoint most of the time. Sometimes I will use um, a document camera, just face it down to the paper, and then I'll draw, for example, um, like for, I'm thinking, well, what do I do this for, cardiac. Like I'll draw a, car, uh, a heart, um, and I'm quite the artist, I'm sure, and I draw a heart, and then I talk about all the ways that the heart can be affected, for example, by um, you know, congestive heart failure, um, how we would assess that, those sorts of things. And I just use it as I'm drawing on a piece of paper while the webcam is recording it. But what I do when I use my PowerPoints is I use my old PowerPoints and I just pair them way, way down. And I get to the meat and I say, what is it that I want my students to know when they come to class? 
So if I have, for example, six slides reviewing the anatomy and physiology or maybe the patho on something, I've come to the realization that by the time my nursing student is in the nursing courses, in my program anyways, they have had anatomy and physiology. They have had um, the pathophysiology. So what I do is say, if you need to review A and P, please do so. If you need to review patho, please do so. And then I move right to what I need them to know for these learning objectives that I want them to learn. And then I just sit down and do a quick video. And like I said, I don't spend a whole lot of time on editing. There are some of these um, products that you can use to make your, your videos that have awesome, like, call-outs, and you can put in, you can emphasize something, and you can put a big bang thing in there, whatever. I got really interested in that, and I'm pretty techie, so I really like to, and I started spending a whole lot of time on a 10-minute video. I don't do that anymore. The students say it's just the same to them. They don't really care. They just want to hear the lecture and hear what they need to know. So that's the way I do my offload. Sometimes I do it on my, uh, I'm not endorsing any product or anything, but sometimes I do it on my iPad because they've got some really neat apps. So I just uh, turn it into a PDF, email it to myself, open it on my iPad, and then I'll do a um, just a little talkie on the iPad and record it and upload it right to the uh, web. So it's really quite easy. I think you guys will find once you start doing it, it seems pretty intimidating, but once you start doing it, it's super easy. Thanks, Karen. Mm -hmm. We have time for maybe about two questions, and I'll kind of pose them together. We had an instructor ask uh, via chat at the beginning of the lecture, is it necessary to lecture about every single topic for the week? And then we also have another instructor uh, who's creating um, recorded online lectures, but her students aren't um, doing any of the pre-work, they're not listening to the recorded lectures that might be based on the case studies. Do you have any suggestions? Are you running into that? And if so, what would you suggest to faculty? So the first is, is it necessary to lecture about every single topic? And then secondarily, any suggestions for ways to motivate the students to actually do this work before coming to class? Okay, I think the, the first question can, um hopefully be taken care of by looking at the set of learning objectives that you have for your flipped classroom, whether it be an entire class or maybe just one class. So if you pick one class, for example, I had used earlier my example about menstrual regularity, irregularity that I'm, I'm working on this week. And you have to look at those learning objectives and see, okay, which ones are lower ordered that I can put offload, and those are the ones that you can do offload. Then everything else where you're asking them to apply that, you can do within the classroom. For example, like the, the second uh, question about case studies. I use a lot of case-based learning and some problem-based learning, a lot of just-in-time teaching, and, and I try to make sure that anything that I think that would be easier for them to learn that I could just lecture to them about anyways, I do those in my videos, and then everything else I have them try to apply it in the classroom. So if you start thinking about your um, classroom in sort of that split idea, like in the model, it's all the same kind of set of jelly, but it all kind of goes to one side or the other, depending on what those learning objectives are. Um, I do think that it's really important not to give students, and I think I said this during the webinar, not to give students additional work um, outside the classroom that you just couldn't get to within the class. To really make the flipped model work, you have to make sure the students are engaged with something outside the classroom and then come into the classroom and apply it while you're there to help them. The second question was about offload and students not uh, listening to the lectures, that sort of thing. I think the evaluation chapter will really help with that and some great ideas about how to do maybe some uh, graded quicker questions or embedding some instructions in the video about what students need to bring to class. Um, remember when, you, when you're when you writing your syllabus, part of, oh, you know, I should have written this in the book now that I'm thinking about it, uh, part of your syllabus or your syllabus is a learning contract with the student. And you really need to write your syllabus in the way that flipped learning is the culture of the classroom. And so my students, and this is part of preparing yourself and preparing the students, my students know that when they come into my classroom, um, it's a different culture, and that they are expected to do the videos ahead of time prior to coming. 
And when I talk about the culture that way and the students um, get into groups and they start to work on a case study and we figure out that one student really didn't do the work and doesn't understand, um, many times there are two things that, that I've seen happen anyways, is that the group members will try to bring that student alongside and they feel a little bit of guilt and then after that they watch the videos so that they can contribute. And the other is that they tend to ostracize that member a little bit and get the same result, that they start to watch the videos and, and pay more attention and get to it. And like I said, I think our students deserve a little bit of grace from time to time. So I always write that in my syllabus that, you know what, you're, I do the same thing when I teach in my online class. I'm like, you know what, you're going to have a week during this class where you're going to have a hard week, and I'm going to give you a pass, which means you don't necessarily have to do discussion board. You're going to have to do uh, something for me, maybe write a short essay or a paper or a reflective journal that will get to the same topics, but I'm going to give you a pass uh, once a semester because I think I deserve grace uh, from time to time when I'm sick or when I, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with something. So I want to give my students that same grace, but we don't want them to take advantage of the method and not be engaged in the learning. And I think that Chapter 1 talks a little bit about that as well, talking to students um, about their responsibility as adult learners and then partnering with the students, I think, has really helped me with this issue as well. And when you partner with them, you actually prepare them well. I think that really goes a long way to helping them get on board with what you're trying to do to increase their learning. Well, Karen, thank you so much for taking the time to answer, you know, quite a few questions that have come in. As sure. we can see, this is a really hot topic and is of, you know, much interest to nursing faculty out there no matter what course area they're teaching in. Unfortunately, we are at the top of the hour, and I know that we do have some questions that were unanswered, so um, I will actually work with Karen to make sure that those get answered and that those get messaged out appropriately. But Karen's book will publish um, in March 2016, so please be on the lookout for that. We invite you um, to share the recording of this webinar when it's available by visiting go.jblearning.com, and also just to become a fan of uh, JBL Nursing, you can go to www.facebook slash JBL Nursing, and Karen will be sharing some tips with us uh, between now and when uh, the book publishes. So I want to thank everyone for spending an hour with us today and discussing this important topic, and many thanks to Dr. Karen Hessler for, you know, sharing all of uh, her wonderful insights and the work that she's done so far. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Excellent. Well, this concludes today's presentation, and we do hope that you'll join us again.